Welcome to the 8th unit of grade 10, Characteristics of Organisms. In this lesson, we are going to discuss about the basic characteristics of living organisms and the importance of these characteristics for the maintenance of life. So, uh, here we are going to discuss about eight major characteristics of organisms. Out of these eight, some organisms may show only one or few living characteristics. There may be organisms who are uh, exhibiting all these living characteristics. Uh, the common characteristics are shared here. You can see them on your screen. Uh, first thing is cellular organization, nutrition, respiration, irritability and coordination, excretion, movement, reproduction, growth and development. So we'll move on to these uh, characteristics one by one. First thing is cellular organization. So you have learned about the structure of the cell as the basic uh, structural and functional unit of life. So there are both unicellular organisms as well as multicellular organisms. In unicellular organ organisms, uh, the cellular organization cannot be seen. They show organelle level organization. When it comes to multicellular organisms, they exhibit this uh, cellular level organization. So here you are shown some of the uh, unicellular organisms like Chlamydomonas, which is an algae. It is a green alga. And then uh, Euglena, uh, which is a protozoan. Then amoeba, again a protozoan. It does not have a distinct shape. Here in Chlamydomonas, uh, this is the shape and it consists of two flagella. And there is a cup-shaped uh, uh, chloroplast. And here Euglena, it also consists of a flagellum for locomotion. Amoeba does not have a distinct shape. And again paramecium, which is a... A uh, ciliated protozoan, it has the shape of a shoal of a shoe and the whole body is covered by cilia. These are used for locomotion. So these are some of the unicellular organisms and you know bacteria are also unicellular like lactobacillus, uh, vibrio, likewise you can name so many bacteria. Then uh, we'll, the, these organisms show, these unicellular organisms show cellular level organization. Sorry, they, they exhibit organelle level organization. Then we'll move on to multicellular organisms. They are, first we'll learn how the origin of multicellular organisms take place. So we will take the example of development of embryo of human. So here you can see uh, the human gametes. The male gamete is the sperm and it has a haploid genetic composition. And the female gamete which we call as the ovum, again it has a haploid genetic composition. Then these two gametes will fuse during fertilization to form the diploid zygote, which is a single cell. So this is how the life of this multicellular organism, the human being, takes place. So though we have several millions of cells in our body, once we are grown up, our life begins with a single cell which we call as the zygote. 
then the zygote undergoes cell division actually here onwards all these cell divisions are mitotic cell divisions or what we call as mitosis uh, the, as a result of cell division the number of cells increase and we, we call this cluster of cells as the morula and the number of cells will be further increased due to mitosis and it will form a structure known as the embryo and the embryo will develop into the fetus actually we call the embryo as the fetus after 11 weeks of development then uh, this fetus is developed into an infant and after the infant is grown up we call it as an adult so this is the development of the embryo of human so this can be taken as an example to show the origin of multicellular organisms then we compare the unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms there we can say unicellular organisms have an organelle level organization you know there are several organelles inside a cell which are responsible for different functions so unicellular organisms have organelle level organization and these organelles are well developed to perform different functions for example the chloroplast is responsible for photosynthesis mitochondrion is responsible for cellular respiration nucleus is responsible for controlling cellular activities and transmission of genetic material from generation to generation likewise there are organelles which are well developed to perform different functions then when it comes to multicellular organisms we can say tissue and system level organization is there we will learn about this tissue and system level organization in a coming example then here we can say organs are well developed to perform different functions here organelles are developed to perform different functions in multicellular organisms organs are developed to perform different functions if we take the plant body the leaves flowers fruits these are the organs of a plant if we take the animal body heart liver kidney lungs these are considered to be the organs uh, then uh, we'll move on to this diagram which shows the parts of the plant body so here you know there are two main systems in a plant above the ground level we find the shoot system and below the ground level we find the root system so root system consists of as this is a, a dicot there is a tap root as well as there are lateral roots and these roots consist of root hair cells and when we consider the shoot system there are leaves the stem flowers flower buds and flowers so if we consider the stem and the veins of leaves they consist of the conducting tissues uh, like xylem and phloem and the basic units of these xylem and phloem tissues are xylem cell and phloem cell you we learn in grade 11 that there are uh, four types of cells in each of these in xylem as well as in phloem and uh, here they have shown a cross section of uh, the leaf here the uh, epidermal cells are shown palisade parenchyma cells spongy parenchyma then here the stomatal pore is shown and they have shown how the stomatal pore is made there are two guard cells in between the two guard cells uh, there is the stoma or the stomatal opening so this is how uh, the plant body is made out of cells tissues and systems so i must say that in grade 11 first unit you will learn about these tissues and these cross sections and all about these then uh, 
the organizational levels identified in living organisms uh, we can give examples for these then we'll come to the human body they are again you are shown uh, uh, here I have mentioned different systems in the human body blood circulatory system digestive system excretory system respiratory system skeletal system uh, reproductive system endocrine system and nervous system so if we consider the organs present in those blood circulatory system consist of the heart and uh, blood vessels are there and uh, the, there are several tissues the heart consists of cardiac muscles and uh, in the blood tissue there are blood cells white blood cells red blood cells and if we take the nervous system the basic unit in the nervous system is the nerve cell or what we call as the neuron and the skeletal system consists of bones and uh, there are muscles also uh, which help for the movements in the body and in the reproductive system there are gamete cells and uh, the whole body is covered with the skin which is an um, epithelial uh, tissue and this consists of skin cells or the epithelial cells likewise there is a cellular level tissue level organ level and system level organization in human body as well so we'll Name the organizational levels identified in living organisms like this. So these are the organizational levels. A cell tissue. Cell is the basic unit. A number of cells get together to form a tissue. A number of tissues will form an organ. And a number of organs will form a system. And the collection of different systems will make an organism. So, for example, I have taken a cardiac muscle cell. It forms the cardiac muscle tissue and these tissues are helpful for the formation of the heart which is an organ and heart is in the blood circulatory system and a number of systems like blood circulatory system and all the other systems I mentioned be, uh, before form the human body the human being which is an organism so you can see examples for each level of organization cell tissue organ systems and organism if we take the plant body i have given an example parenchyma cell a number of parenchyma cells form parenchyma tissue and this parenchyma tissue is available in leaves as well as fruits and flowers also here I have considered the leaf as the organ and a number of leaves helpful for the formation of the shoot system. Not only the leaf, shoot system is the system which consists of organs including leaves. Then shoot system and root system collectively form the plant body. So these are the examples for the organizational levels identified in living organisms. So we have discussed the first living characteristic that is cellular organization. Then we will move on to the second characteristic that is nutrition. So nutrition is the process by which organisms obtain materials for the maintenance of life. So if we don't take food we don't get energy but taking food is the process of nutrition that is the process by which we obtain materials for the maintenance of life. So these materials will then undergo cellular respiration in order to produce energy which is our next topic. So depending on the uh, 
ability of producing food organisms are divided into autotrophs and heterotrophs here you are asked to define the terms autotrophs are the organisms which can produce their own food heterotrophs are the organisms which cannot produce their own food so animals are heterotrophs autotrophs are then further divided into photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs so photoautotrophs are the organisms which make use of light energy in the production of food in other words photoautotrophs are the organisms which make use of light energy in the process of producing food examples green plants algae and cyanobacteria then chemoautotrophs some body will call these as chemoautotrophs so here these organisms make use of the energy released in a chemical reaction for the production of food example most bacteria they make use of the energy released in a chemical reaction for the production of food here light energy here energy released in a chemical reaction then photosynthesis what is this photosynthesis so this is the word equation which describes photosynthetic reaction there are major raw materials are carbon dioxide and water and this happens only in the presence of uh, actually we don't need to mention sunlight here if we say light energy it is okay it is the source of energy and chlorophyll is the substrate so the factors necessary for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide water sunlight and chlorophyll when these four factors are present green plants or the photoautotrophs will produce glucose as the main product and they will release oxygen as a by product so here the balanced chemical equation for photosynthesis is shown and this is the balanced chemical equation later you will learn how to balance an equation here a uh, six carbon dioxide molecules which are in gaseous state six water molecules which are in liquid state in the presence of light energy and chlorophyll and uh, they will produce glucose you know this is the chemical formula of glucose c6h12o6 and it is in the solid state and this is the by product oxygen o2 and six o oxygen molecules are there in order to balance the equation 6CO2 plus 6H2O in the presence of light energy and chlorophyll C6H12O6 and 6O2 these are the word equation and the balanced chemical equation for photosynthesis reaction so you know that photosynthesis takes place in green plants and main photosynthetic structures are the leaves so as a result of photosynthesis glucose is produced and that glucose is stored temporarily in stems uh sorry this stored glucose is temporarily stored in leaves in the form of starch and that starch should be translocated to the other parts of the plant that is in the form of a sucrose solution stored starch in the leaves are translocated to the other parts of the plant in the form of a sucrose solution then after that again that is stored as starch in other plant parts such as stems roots and fruits 
so that is all about uh, photosynthesis and if you think of a food chain as well as a food web you will be able to uh, think of the autotrophs and the heterotrophs who are existing in the environment so this is what we have discussed and you know photosynthesis happens mainly in leaves and i explained what happens to produced glucose after photosynthesis then these are the different modes of nutrition shown by the animals uh, and plants as well as microorganisms so you know about autotrophs then there are heterotrophs all the animals are heterotrophs and in addition to that there are decomposers decomposers are mainly of two types detritivores and saprophytes so these detritivores are uh, depending on dead or decaying uh, organic matter and saprophytes are feeding upon uh, nutrients obtained from uh, decaying organic matter so uh, detritivores for example we can take the earthworm as a detritivore and bacteria and fungi who are the main decomposers come under saprophytes and another mode of feeding or another mode of nutrition uh, is parasitism parasites uh, are living on a host and they obtain nutrients from the host's body so far we have discussed about uh, cellular organization and nutrition then we'll move on to respiration the process by which we obtain energy now you learned in during nutrition we obtain the materials required to sustain life during respiration what happens is the food that we have taken undergoes digestion and end products of food digestion or the digestive end products undergo cellular respiration to produce energy digestive end products undergo cellular respiration to produce energy cellular respiration is a series of biochemical reactions so you know that cellular respiration takes place inside the mitochondrion so if we talk about respiration cellular respiration is a part of it so muscular movements that allow the passage of air in and out of respiratory organs are called respiratory movements so later you in grade 11 you will learn that uh, the the external part of the respiratory system the external respiration and uh, the uh, internal respiratory movements and finally the respirate uh, cellular respiration taking place so here you are given a simple activity to show that carbon dioxide is released during respiration this is the setup used for that if i explain the setup first uh, materials required are lime water you know that is calcium hydroxide potassium hydroxide water five equal bottles with corks certain glass tubes and a frog so you can see the uh, the five glass bottles are connected by this using the uh, glass tubes and you can see in a in bottle a there is potassium hydroxide and this tube is immersed in potassium hydroxide the second tube is out of potassium hydroxide it is in air then you can see it is connected to 
water B and this end of the tube is again immersed in lime water or calcium hydroxide. The end of the next tube is out of calcium hydroxide and the end of the tube is close to the frog inside bottle A and the next tube and the end is immersed in lime water again and this end is out of lime water and then this end is immersed in water and you can see bottle E is connected to a suction pump or a tap. So once, uh, once we have put the things as shown in the diagram we have to open the tap that will allow a continuous flow of air from P onwards likewise a continuous flow of air will be maintained once we open the tap. So here uh, we have to use colorless lime water in both instances and you know potassium hydroxide is important to absorb carbon dioxide gas. And you know here we are going to show that carbon dioxide is released during respiration. The frog is used as a living organism for that purpose. If, you, if we can't find a frog, uh, we can use uh, germinating seeds like germinating green gram or something. For bottle C, arrange the apparatus as shown above and remove water in bottle E by opening the tap. Then we'll move on to the questions based on this. What is the purpose of adding KOH into A? So potassium hydroxide is added into A in order to absorb carbon dioxide gas which is coming from outside. The normal air enters from P and carbon dioxide in that air is absorbed by potassium hydroxide. Then we know that there is no carbon dioxide in the air uh, which is passing from bottle A to B. Then, what can be observed in lime water in B and D? Give reasons. So, uh, since there is no carbon dioxide in the air which is passing from bottle A to B, you know, lime water will not turn milky. You know, carbon dioxide gas is uh, absorbed, is obtained by lime water and that lime water turns milky if there is carbon dioxide. In B, lime water does not turn milky as there is no carbon dioxide. If I mention the reason, if you can remember in grade 6 also, you have learned that lime, colorless lime water is used to identify carbon dioxide gas. Once carbon dioxide gas reacts with li uh, colorless lime water or calcium hydroxide, it forms calcium carbonate and water. As calcium carbonate particles get suspended, uh, this turns milky color. So our observations are in B, lime water does not turn milky. In D, lime water turns milky. The reason is, during the respiration of the frog, carbon dioxide gas is released and that gas gets dissolved in lime water in D. Therefore, in D, uh, lime water turns milky. Then, why E is connected to a suction pump? I told you it is to maintain a continuous flow of air. What can be inserted in C instead of the frog? So you can mention germinating seeds like germinating green gram. Mm. Then another activity to show that oxygen is absorbed during respiration. During respiration oxygen gas is absorbed and carbon dioxide gas is released. So this is the experiment to show the, that oxygen is absorbed for respiration. You need two conical flasks. These are conical flasks. Uh, then glass tubes are needed. Then a rubber tube. Small test tube. 
two beakers, colored water, and germinating seeds. So you can see both these A and B setups are similar except the potas tube with potassium hydroxide in setup A. So you can understand here you are said to close the flask with the cork lid connected to a rubber tube and a U-tube is a U-tube uh, is attached as shown in the diagram. This is the U-tube, U-shaped tube. After some time, tighten the rubber tube. So, this was opened earlier to external air. After some time, this was tightened to stop the flow of air from outside to in. Then here what happens is that here we assume that the carbon dioxide released and oxygen gained is more or less the same. The two volumes are the same. That is an assumption. So here in A what happens is during respiration carbon dioxide gas is given out and that gas is absorbed by potassium hydroxide. And oxygen gas is obtained for the by, uh, for the respiration by the germinating seeds so two gases are removed from this volume inside the conical flask to as gases are matter to fill that gap this colored water go up through the youtube to occupy that space but in b Oxygen gas is obtained and carbon dioxide gas is released as we have assumed also the volume of the two gases are the same. There is no space for this colored water to climb up or to rise along the YouTube. Therefore colored water level in tube B or setup B does not change but in A it will be changed. So we will move on to the questions based on this activity. What are the assumptions made here? So you can say all carbon dioxide is absorbed by potassium hydroxide. That is one assumption we made. All carbon dioxide gas is absorbed by potassium hydroxide. And the second assumption is that the volume of oxygen obtained and the volume of carbon dioxide released are the same. Then explain the observations as I have explained. In A, as carbon dioxide gas is absorbed by potassium hydroxide, there is more uh, space that is empty. And oxygen is also taken by the seeds for respiration. Therefore, there is much more space empty. To occupy that space, this colored water rise along the YouTube. But in B, as there is no space to occupy, colored water does not rise up. Then, uh, what is the drawback of this experiment? Actually, uh, the drawback in this experiment is we can't prove that the gas which is taken or obtained for respiration is oxygen. We can't prove that it is oxygen but uh, we know that oxygen is available about 21 or 20% in the atmosphere. So that is if you, we consider this height as simple H. So H over 5. So, 20% means 1 over 5. Actually, we can't prove it like that. So, that is the drawback in this experiment that we can't prove the obtained gas is oxygen. From this activity, we can't prove it, but we can design another activity to show that. Uh, then, the next living characteristic is irritability and coordination. To understand those two terms, here I have given a simple representation. So there are a lot of changes happening in the uh, in both 
internal and external environment those changes that take place which are strong enough to bring about a response in us are known as stimuli singular is stimulus change in internal or external environment which is strong enough to bring about a response is known as a stimulus so once there is a change or once you obtain a stimulus actually that is obtained by the receptors in our body there are five receptors or what we call as sensory organs these are the organs which detect stimuli the organs which detect stimuli are known as receptors or the sensory organs if we mention the five receptors ears eyes nose tongue and the skin these are the five sensory organs we have then uh, stimuli are taken by those receptors and then finally we have to come up with a response if i mention an example your hand touches a hot kettle accidentally so the stimulus or the change in the environment is heat so that is received by your skin by the skin of your hand so the receptor or the sensory organ is the skin then ultimately your response is you take off your hand quickly the taking off the hand is the response to give out that response an effector becomes helpful remember the effectors are always either glands or muscles here in my example the effector is the muscles of your hand and once we get a stimulus once we get a stimulus until we come up with a response the coordination part is done by several systems in the body it may be either the nerves nervous system or the endocrine system then uh, so we have defined stimuli and receptors so here you can mention the names of receptors uh so if we take ears the stimuli is sound eyes stimuli light skin th there are several stimuli uh vibrations heat pressure touch likewise pain then if we take the nose smell tongue it is the taste then a response is a reaction according to the change in the environment or the, a reaction according to the stimulus obtained is known as a response then irritability is the ability to respond to stimuli so the characteristic of living organisms is irritability and coordination so irritability is the ability to respond to stimuli coordination is the communication between different organs during responding to a stimulus communication between different organs during responding to a stimulus is known as coordination so the effectors are either muscles or glands and they are helpful to come up with a response then you are asked to give example separately for the instances where plants and animals respond to stimuli so i mentioned an example where animals respond to stimuli so some animals are running away when when they hear a sound 
or uh, when we touch a hot object we take off our hand immediately once we step on a thorn we take off our foot immediately um, likewise then uh, plants also respond to stimuli uh, they are the stimuli may be touch light intensity change in light intensity for example leaves of mimosa fold when they are touched then uh, leaves of thor tamarind sesbenia or katurumurunga fold at night because of the less light intensity so these are the uh, instances where plants respond to stimuli and also you know plants grow the tip of the plant or the shoot tip shoot apex grow towards light that is also a response given out by plants so both plants and animals have irritability and coordination then the fifth uh, living characteristic that is excretion so excretion is the uh, removal of by products from the body that are produced during metabolism removal of by products from the body that are produced during metabolism is known as excretion then what are these metabolic activities actually we can say metabolic activities are the sum of chemical and uh, physiological activities within the cell and these are for your extra knowledge uh, metabolic activities are of two types that those are anabolism and catabolism during anabolism uh, simple compounds get together to form a complex compound their energy is stored in the complex compound during catabolism a complex compound is broken into simple substances their energy is released so these are metabolic activities so excretion is the removal of by products from the body that are produced during those metabolic activities happening inside living bodies so here this table is uh, write about the excretory organs present in human body and the form of excretion as well as the excretory materials if we take uh, lungs it is also an excretory organ form of excretion from lungs is exhaled air and then the excretory materials from lungs are carbon dioxide and water vapor carbon dioxide gas and water vapor then if we take the skin as the next excretory organ the form of excretion is sweat and the excretory materials which contain in sweat are mainly water and salt in addition to that there may be a certain amount of urea as well main excretory materials in sweat are water and salt then the main excretory organ that is the kidney so the form of excretion is urine and the excretory materials are urea water and salt water and salts there are different types of salts so kidney is the nitrogenous and kidney is the organ in which nitrogenous excretion of human body mainly takes place then plants also excrete do you think so during respiration of plants carbon dioxide is released as uh, an unnecessary substance therefore carbon dioxide becomes an excretory product during respiration of plants then during photosynthesis plants release oxygen as a by product their oxygen becomes an excretory product by plants during photosynthesis 
So both this carbon dioxide and oxygen are released through stomata in leaves as well as the lenticels. Then we'll move on to the next uh, living characteristic that is movement. So both plants and animals move. Why do they move? They move as a response to stimuli. Now you know what the, the meaning of the term stimuli, the changes in the environment. So sometimes a whole organism moves. So when the whole organism moves, we call it as a locomotion. Locomotion, this happens in animals. And sometimes a uh, part of the organism moves. When we take unicellular organisms, they use flagella, cilia, as well as pseudopodia for locomotion. So, if you can remember at the very beginning, I showed you flagella are present in Chlamydomonas, Euglena, and cilia are present in um, uh, Paramecium, and pseudopodia uh, they are in Amoeba. They use these for locomotion, the whole cell moves. And in unicellular organisms, organelles also show movements. The internal organelles also show certain movements. When we come to multicellular organisms, whole body or part of the body moves with the help of muscles. If, we, if you think of uh, your body, uh, Sometimes the whole body moves and sometimes the part of the body moves with the help of muscles. When we take plants, plants also show certain movements. As I mentioned earlier, shoot apex moves or grows towards light. We call it as a positive phototropic movement or positive phototropism. You have learned about these in grade 9. Then the root apex grows or moves towards gravity that is the ground therefore we call this as positive geotropism or negative phototropism but there are certain exceptions like pneumatophores of mangrove plants they show negative geotropism because they these roots come up from soil in search of air Therefore, these new metaphors show negative geotropism. And uh, later you will learn what happens to pollen grains once they are deposited on the uh, stigma of a flower in a coming unit. They are the pollen tube grows towards the ovary for fertilization to take place. Uh, so there we call this type of a movement as a positive chemotropism. And in order to show these uh, movements, you learn that uh, these movements take place as a response to stimuli. So there are different stimuli like light, darkness, chemicals, gravitational force, heat or temperature, as well as vibrations or touch. So as a result of, as a response to those Stimuli, both plants and animals come up with movements. Right. Then the seventh characteristic is reproduction. You know, reproduction is the production of new organisms or new generation by a unicellular or multicellular organism for the continuation of their species production of new of a new generation by unicellular or multicellular organisms for the continuation of their species is known as reproduction so this reproduction process can be divided into two main types as sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction so during sexual reproduction Fusion of gametes of two individuals of the same species take place. 
the gametes of two individuals of the same species takes place there are two individuals male individual and the female so the gametes will fuse uh, during sexual reproduction so in a coming unit you have to learn about this sexual reproduction separately then during asexual reproduction single organism produces identical offsprings that means there is only one individual it will produce identical offsprings are the members of the new generation the, the new individuals produced by this single organism are identical that means they are more or less similar to each other as examples uh, uh, plants undergo vegetative propagation that means for example propagation of new plants by vegetative structures of plants for example if we uh, plant a twig of a plant it will produce uh, an identical offspring or identical plant to the mother plant then uh, budding takes place in hydra and fragmentation uh, takes place in planaria that means the body is broken into uh, several fragments then regeneration that happens in echinodermates like uh, starfish that is about reproduction i am not going to explain it further because uh, there is a separate lesson for this reproduction process then the last characteristic is growth and development so what is this growth actually growth of a unicellular organism can be defined as the increase in size and the volume of the cell growth of a unicellular organism can be defined as the increase in size and the volume of a cell the size and the volume of the cell increases then we can call it as a growth of a unicellular organism examples uh, for unicellular organisms paramecium yeast chlamydomonas then growth of a multicellular organism is this occurs by means of mitotic cell divisions if you can remember at the very beginning i mentioned uh, i took the example of the development of uh, uh, human development of uh, the human embryo there uh, i mentioned that uh, the zygote the single cell divides so it undergoes mitotic cell divisions and it forms a number of cells a cluster of cells which we call as the morula then the morula develops into an embryo and then into fetus then into an infant and an adult likewise the whole process the zygote develops into the complete multicellular organism by means of mitotic cell divisions so growth of a multicellular organism can be de defined as the irreversible increase of dry mass because once a cell absorbs water its mass, mass increases but when we take the dry mass it is the real growth and it is an irreversible process once an organism is grown really we can't take it to the initial status again if you think of yourself uh, you have grown you have undergo uh, undergone the growth as an irreversible process you can't be that small child again so remember growth is the irreversible increase of dry mass and what is this development that is the increase in the complexity of the cell that means now if we think of our body we are not that the cluster of cells which we saw at the very beginning our body has been differentiated into different systems before that there are different tissues organs so this cluster has been differentiated modified adapted for different functions and different structures 
the same cluster has been differentiated in or into form different tissues different organs and different systems that is what we call as the differentiation increase in the complexity of the uh, cell increase in the complexity of the cell is known as the development so this growth and development includes three steps these are irreversible increase in size of the cell that is the growth increase in number of cells by cell division the number of cells is being increased and these are cells are differentiated into different uh, organs and systems irreversible increase in size of the cell increase in the number of cells and cell differentiation these are the steps in growth and development of an organism then this oxonometer is a setup which can be used to show the growth of a plant uh, again uh, that this is not that uh, uh, practical but uh, you have to learn about this setup as a setup used to observe the growth of a plant so here you can see there is a potted plant and the shoot apex is connected with a string and the other end of the string is connected with a weight and it is sent across a pulley and the pulley is hanging here and uh, the pulley is connected to an indicator so when the pulley is rotating the indicator will also move and here there is a scale which is kept on a stand so when when the indicator moves we can get the reading out of the scale so here what happens is when the plant grows the height of the shoot apex increases so the because of the weight the string will be pulled downwards like this so the pulley will rotate once the weight is moving down so as a result the indicator will also show a slight movement and you will be able to obtain the value so this is used to make measure the growth of a plant this is known as the oxonometer according to the figure the thread is connected to the shoot apex of a potted plant and it is sent through a pulley and a weight is hung on to it you are asked to observe how the indicator moves white thread uh, right that is uh, about the growth and development then uh, i we have discussed about all the eight factors that we mentioned at the beginning cellular organization nutrition respiration irritability and coordination excretion movement reproduction then finally growth and development and after that there are certain uh, things for your knowledge white thread like mass on a pile of decomposing garbage is the somatic part somatic means the growth part of a fungus so we have observed the white thread like masses on the a decaying log on garbage uh, spoiled food we have seen so that is this white thread like structures are the fungal hyphae or the growth part of fungi later some of these are transformed into mushrooms which are the sexual reproductive structures of fungi mushrooms are sexual reproductive structures of fungi actually these information are given in order to uh, give you an idea that there are uh, visual uh, living structures uh, in the environment and some of these living structures cannot be identified actually as living things so to give you an idea about this this information are given you can observe lichen growing on a coconut trunk or ferns and orchids grow on a wall mealybugs on chili or 
pepper plants, mealybugs, which are white in color again, small fragile white eggs on leaflets of Sesbania katurumurunga, and identify they, whether they are living or non living. That these are given as examples. Once you see lichens, have you, you have seen definitely uh, on large trees there are white or ash or sometimes light green color structures, uh, patches like structures on those large trees, these are lichens. Uh, actually, a lichen is a, a symbiotic relationship in between um, fungi and algae. Or this may be a relationship in between fungi and cyanobacteria. Fungi and algae or fungi and cyanobacteria. They make a symbiotic relationship in order to form lichens. Then, sometimes living or non-living nature of some substances cannot be identified easily. Living or non-living nature of some substances cannot be identified easily. If you uh, look at those uh, uh, different colored masses on uh, tree trunks, you will think that whether they are living or non-living. The mealybugs, they don't actually move sometimes. So, you once you see them, you will think whether they are living or non-living. The fragile white eggs on leaflets of Sesbania, it is difficult to identify whether they are living or non-living. Bacteria cells can be dried into a powder. And you have seen yeast, which is a fungus, and it is used to make bread, which is available in the market. As, uh, yeast is available in the market as a dried powder. So there are instances where we uh, think whether these are living or non-living. Then uh, these days. We are talking about virus a lot. There are a lot of viruses. Uh, so, we don't consider that viruses are living substances and we don't consider them as non-living substances because they have uh, characteristics in between living and non-living. So, if we take, if we consider virus, some living entities cannot be easily identified whether they are living or non-living. Example, virus. Actually, viruses are very small and they can be observed only through the electron microscope. And they are about um, one, one of thousand parts of the size of a bacteria. That means if uh, a virus is very small, a bacterium is thousand times larger than a virus. A bacterium is thousand times larger than a virus. Virus are that much small. So they show living or non-living features according to their status. Therefore we call, don't call them as living organisms and we can't say that they are non-living as well. If we consider the structure, uh, this is the structure of a uh, model of a virus which is seen through the electron microscope. So they have a DNA or RNA molecule. DNA or RNA. Both do not exist. Which is covered with a protein capsid and there is a tail. Here the tail fibers are also shown. A virus is not considered as a cell. They are composed of a nucleic acid enclosed by a protein capsid. The nucleic acid may be either DNA or RNA. Viruses with different shapes and sizes have been identified. If you have time later you can search the images of virus. There are so many nice shapes but they cause a lot of harmful diseases both to uh, human beings, uh, animals as well as plants. Viruses do not possess any organelles for metabolic reactions. So these facts are very important because you have to remember these for your MCQs. 
virus becomes active only inside a host cell so when a virus is on the external environment or on a non living surface it cannot be activated it becomes active only inside the host cell so once the virus is pollen on a living cell then it will release the genetic material either dna or rna then it starts to multiply inside the living cell that is how uh, viral diseases become uh, fatal common uh, you are given some examples for common diseases in plants caused by viruses banana bunch top disease curly leaf disease of chili and tobacco mosaic virus which causes disease to tobacco plants and there are so many animal viral diseases dengue influenza common cold aids mumps chicken pox ebola rubella chikungunya hepatitis sars which is severe acute respiratory syndrome polio and the well known uh, covid-19 or the corona virus actually covid-19 is coming under corona family and you know the long term of this acquired immunodeficiency syndrome aids which is caused by hiv human immunodeficiency virus so uh i think you have gained a clear idea about the characteristics of living organisms so after studying this you can uh, do the exercises uh, which are coming under unit 8 in your textbook